please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Mark. <clears throat> the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 3. <clears throat> and reading verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Mark chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, And he entered again into the synagogue, <clears throat> and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And our subject this morning is the withered hand. The withered hand. Well, we come to these uh, words before us. And uh, we see here one of the many accounts of uh, one of the healings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's always a joy to uh, consider these uh, uh, miraculous healings that the Lord carried out during his earthly ministry almost exactly 2,000 years ago now in Judea, in Galilee, and the regions round about Galilee. And, uh, well, when we think of the healings of the Lord Jesus Christ, that could uh, in itself be a sermon, why the Lord healed, how he healed. Well, the Lord healed, of course, uh, to teach us so much about himself. That's uh, one of the things we could say, to teach us how kind he is, to teach us how full of compassion he is, how full of love he is for those who are weak for those who are vulnerable, for those who are sick. He is so full of kindness and love and pity. The miracles, of course, showed that he was God. These healing miracles, they showed uh, that he had uh, powers that no man or no uh, doctor could ever have. When he healed, he healed those conditions that, uh, well, they were beyond the help of uh, medical science at the time. And perhaps even still now, he would heal those with terrible afflictions and diseases, those with leprosy, those with uh, paralysis. He would even raise people from the dead. This was the very Son of God. And the miracles, the healings, proved that he was the Son of God, as well as teaching us so much about his uh, character. He was the Son of God. And we affirm this, of course, the second person of the triune Godhead, equal with God the Father. This is why we worship him. And, uh, but this healing, this healing takes place, uh, we read uh, in the synagogue in verse 1. And he entered again into uh, the synagogue in uh, Capernaum. And uh, there is there a man with a withered hand. Now, when we read this account, uh, we learn that it takes place on the Sabbath day. And uh, we also learn, just from these first two verses, that there were some people who were not happy uh, that this healing would take place on the Sabbath day. This was the Jewish Sabbath, of course. The Jewish Sabbath, one day in seven, was uh, kept holy unto the Lord. And for the Jews, that was uh, Saturday. It wasn't Sunday as it is for uh, us Christians. We uh, rejoice and we worship on Sunday because uh, that's the day that the Lord arose. But that's an entirely different matter. But the Jews, they uh, worshipped on uh, Saturday. Well, strictly speaking, it was sundown on Friday uh, until uh, sundown on Saturday. But uh, the Jews had many rules for the Sabbath. Uh, you could not do any work at all. Any work was strictly prohibited. And so this is why some people, well, we read in verse 2, they watched him. They were watching the Lord, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. Because this is their reasoning. Ah, oh, if the Lord Jesus Christ heals this man on the Sabbath day, he's breaking the Sabbath. He's doing work. You're not allowed to do any work on the Sabbath. That's what they held to. No work at all. If this Jesus of Nazareth, if he heals this man, he's breaking the Sabbath. He's doing something. He's doing some work. And so uh, there were people there 
They didn't want the Lord to heal him on the Sabbath day because of their rules. But well, the Lord says to them, doesn't he, in verse 4, he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? The Lord is saying to them, it is permissible to do good on the Sabbath day. God is not going to be angry if you do something good on the Sabbath day, if you save a life on the Sabbath day. That's not what God is going to condemn. This is a good thing, what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing. And this is the great principle of the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Acts of mercy, acts of goodness, works of kindness, they are permissible on the Sabbath day, on the Lord's day. This is why, for example, and I know I'm going off track, but this is why we, uh, uh, we work so hard on the Lord's day. Some people come to this church and they say, you do an awful lot. This is supposed to be a day of rest. Why do you go around and you're so busy on, uh, on the Lord's Day? Well, it is because we are doing those good works. Is it not good? Is it not lawful to do good on the Sabbath day? We are doing good things. We're preaching the word of God. We're bringing in the children so that they hear the word of God, so that they may live. So many of the youngsters in this community, they are lost without Christ. Their souls are dead without Christ. We're bringing them in so that they may hear the word of God and live. This is lawful on the Sabbath day, on the Lord's day. So we have to do these things. And so uh, I just mentioned that because, uh, well, people accuse the Lord Jesus Christ of desecrating the Sabbath. He's working on the Sabbath day. People do the same to us. But we would uh, point them to this verse. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, to save life, to preach the gospel that saves us, saves us to the uttermost. This is what we do. But anyway, back to the narrative and uh, the synagogue and the man with the withered hand. That's who we're supposed to be talking about. Now, he has uh, a withered hand. We'll speak about that a little bit more. But essentially, it means that his hand was powerless. It was useless. It was uh, dried up, literally, in the Greek. It was disabled. And the Lord heals him, as we read earlier. We read in verse 3, He saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And then in verse 5, Stretch forth thine hand. Towards the end of verse 5, Stretch forth thine hand. And the man stretched it out. And his hand was restored whole as the other. This man stretched out his hand to show that he had been healed. He had been wonderfully healed, immediately healed, completely healed. And so uh, that's the healing. But my intention this morning is to delve just a little bit uh, deeper into this miracle, uh, to think about it, to meditate upon it, because this healing serves as an illustration. It's a picture that teaches us about the nature of man and about the ways that the Lord uses to lead man to Christ and what men must do, what men must do to be healed and to be saved. So I'm just going to try and present this as an illustration, as a picture of uh, uh, other important truths. Well, first of all, let us consider that the state of this man resembles the state of all men. The state of this man resembles the state of all men, of all mankind. Now, I've already mentioned that this man had a withered hand, a useless, powerless hand. But uh, that word withered, as I've already said, implies that he wasn't uh, born with that uh, hand in that state. He wasn't born with a useless hand. The hand had been healthy at one stage, but it had withered. That's the implication. It had been healthy, but over the course of time, it had withered, either by disease or because of uh, an accident or something. 
So uh, this man, he hadn't been born with a, a disabled hand. It was uh, a defect that he had acquired. A defect, a disability that he had acquired. And this very much resembles the state of man in general. Now, it resembles the state of man only in this sense, so you have to listen very carefully. The Bible is very clear in teaching us that we are sinners. We, each one of us, we have a defect, each one of us, in us, and that is sin. Man, mankind is corrupt in the sense that every one of us is capable of of doing immoral things, of lying, of stealing, of hating people, of violence and so on. We all have that defect in us. And uh, one objection to this, or something that people will often say, well, they will blame God. They'll blame God. If man is sinful, if man is so corrupt, why did God make us this way? Why are we born this way? Surely this is God's fault. Mankind, yes, they see all the sin. Why did God make us this way? Well, of course, the truth is, he didn't make us this way. God did not make us this way. Man in his original state did not have any defect. Man was created good, morally upright. The first man, Adam, we all know, he had no defect at all, no imperfection, no sin. That was his initial state. But he uh, acquired a defect. He acquired corruption. He corrupted himself, of course. He spoiled himself. And you will know the account very well. He disobeyed God. He took of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that was a terrible mistake. So he wasn't originally made bad, he was originally made good. But he took of that tree, and it led to terrible consequences. He should have obeyed God. God had told him not to eat of that tree if only Adam had obeyed. You know, if Adam had obeyed, if Adam had obeyed the commandment and not eaten of that tree, he would only ever have known that which was good. That's all he would have ever known for his entire life. Only good things. That's all he would have known. But he, he took the fruit of that tree. So not only does he know good, he also knows evil. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam, you can live forever knowing only good things. That's what God wanted for him. Or you can eat of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. You can actually know and experience what is bad, what is evil. Don't eat of that tree, because the day you eat of it, well, we all know, you shall surely die. He could have lived wonderfully, just knowing things that were pure, lovely, and righteous. He ate of that tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And so he brings evil in. Evil into the world, lying, stealing, death, murder, all of these things came in. Adam corrupted himself. So it was an acquired defect. Just like this man, in a sense, he is born without the disability. Well, the first man, Adam, was created without any disability at all. No defect, but it was an acquired defect. He corrupted himself. And this is uh, a picture, really. This man with the withered hand, we think of uh, mankind, fallen sinful men. Not made that way, but, uh, well, our sin nature has been acquired through Adam's sin. That's the first picture. But secondly, we note that this man's disability affected a vital part of him, arguably the most important part of him. It was his hand, but it wasn't just any hand. We read uh, from the uh, gospel according to Luke that this was his right hand. This was his right hand. Now the right hand, particularly in the time of the ancient Jews, was so important. I know we have many left-handed people here, including myself. But if you were left-handed in those days, 
it was kind of a shame. A shame to be left-handed. Everything must be done through the right hand. The right hand had special importance, special prominence. The right hand was the creative hand. It was how you would earn your livelihood. It was your craft. And uh, if the right hand is withered, if it's damaged, well, you can't work. You can't even go into the armed forces. The soldiers, they had to fight with their right arm, with their right hand. This man could do nothing of that. Perhaps this man, well, he couldn't work. If you can't work, you can't support your family. Maybe he doesn't have a family. He's disabled. Maybe he is uh, begging. Maybe that's why he's at the synagogue. His right hand. It's the most important part of him that has been disabled, that has been withered. And this is a great tragedy. But you see, this is a picture of man also. Because the most important part of man has also been disabled. By the fall. By the fall of Adam, the most important part of man has been rendered useless. And I'm not talking about anything physical. I'm talking about the soul. The soul is the most important part of man. We mention this so often. The soul that is the life of you, every single one of you. The soul is your character. The soul is your mind. The soul is your heart, the things you love. The soul is your will, your determination, and so on. Everything that is you is the soul. The soul is so precious. And I mention this from time to time. I hope I don't wear you out with it. But the soul is eternal. It's eternal. The soul is not just for this life. It's eternal. It doesn't age like your body. Your body ages, but your soul doesn't age. And I've spoken to many elderly people who have reached the age of 80, 90, and they will tell you that within themselves, they don't feel any different. Yes, the body is a crumbling and, and breaking down, as it were, but within themselves, they don't feel any different at all. Why is that? Because the soul of a man or a woman doesn't age. It is eternal. And so that's why it's so precious. It's the most important part of a man or a woman. But dear friends, it is so damaged without God. It's useless without God. It's as good as dead without God. It's knocked out and it is not functioning as it ought to. We need the Lord. We cannot live. The soul cannot live off the things of this world. You have all the entertainments, all the music, all the sports and all that. These things cannot fully satisfy the soul, can't even begin to. If you just live off that, your soul is malnourished. It begins to dry up. It begins to wither. If you're just living off the things of this world, no God, no spiritual life, nothing religious, your soul is in a terrible state. And so this is why we preach in this way. What is the state of your soul? You know, we're so uh, good. We're so good at hiding the state of our souls. So good at hiding our inward state. I remember when I was at uh, university a long time ago. I wasn't saved when I was at university. But what I noticed at university was how people were so good at hiding uh, their inward state. Sometimes you would meet people and they seemed so happy. They seemed to be the life and soul of the party. Always joking, always energetic. But then when you spoke to them privately, they're actually the most depressed people. And they're the most uh, downcast and in despair. And the ones who have the most problems. You see, we are so good. We can appear fit and healthy to one another outwardly. But dear friends, what is the state of your soul? The most important part of us is suffering. It's like this man with the withered hand. I'm sure this man, he could have easily hid his, his withered hand. The rest of him looks fine. He could hide his hand under a garment or cloak. No one would uh, think anything was wrong with him. That's just like us. We hide away the despair of our soul with all these worldly entertainments. 
But dear friends, there is something very wrong with us. We must go to the Lord. Dear friends, these are just illustrations. And I hope we can see these things. Thirdly, this account shows us how serious it is to not come to Christ. How serious it is to not come to Christ. Now I've already mentioned that the Pharisees and the Jews, they wanted to accuse the Lord of uh, wrongdoing. They wanted to uh, bring him down. They wanted to uh, discredit him. Their hearts were hardened against the Lord Jesus Christ. And this was a great sin. This was a terrible sin. And the Lord saw their sin. And actually you read in this account that he was angry. In verse 5, when he had looked round about on them with anger. So uh, sometimes you hear people saying, oh, the Lord Jesus would never get angry. Or uh, God never gets angry at anybody. Well, I would suggest you point them to this verse. Because it, we read here, he looked round about on them with anger. With anger. God does get angry. Of course he does. But by the way, this is not sinful anger. The Lord is not uh, uh, losing his temper wickedly like we so often do. We read actually that his anger is driven by grief. When he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved, grieved for the hardness of their hearts. You see, this anger is not driven by anything wicked. It's sadness. He was grieved at the hardness of hearts. The Lord Jesus Christ is grieved when he sees people reject him. When he sees people not turn to him. He's so full of sadness. Why would this person, why would this man, this woman, this child turn away from me when I do so much, when I give them so much, their life, their health, everything that they possess, I've given so much to them. The Lord is grieved when he sees you continually turn away from him. And there is anger too. There is that anger, that righteous indignation because of the sin, the hardness of hearts of the people. Dear friends, we must seek the Lord. The Lord deserves your praise. You say you have everything. You have to give thanks to the Lord for everything that you have. Otherwise, that's a great sin. And we have to give thanks, of course, to the Lord for that unspeakable gift that he has given to us, the Lord Jesus Christ. We must give thanks to God for him because Christ came. God sent his only begotten son to save us from the anger of God. God gets angry. We have read that. God is angry at sin in the world. God is angry at sin in us. And we have all sinned. We've all sinned. If we are honest, we know this. And God knows this. And we cannot hide anything from God. We can hide our souls from one another. We can hide all our sins from one another. You can't hide them from God. God sees your sin. God is angry at your sin. But that is why he sent the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ stands in our place. So that he takes the punishment. He takes the wrath of God. The anger of God upon himself. For all those who believe in him. All those who trust in Christ. He is my savior. Yes I have sinned. God is angry at me. But Christ died for me. He took my place. Because he loves me. That's the gospel. That is what God has done. And we must thank him for that. Dear friends. We must worship him and praise him for that and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that he has died in our place. These things are wonderful. Time is running on. Fourthly, we see in this account how we ought to come to the Lord. How we ought to come to the Lord. Well, I read earlier the instruction that the Lord gave to the man. Verse 3, he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, 
stand for. Stand for. Now, really, that means the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to this man, make yourself known. Make yourself known. If you want to be healed, you have to make yourself willing. Stand for. Don't hide yourself away. Stand for. Get it done. And this is how it is for seekers, anybody seeking the Lord Jesus Christ in this place. Christ is willing to receive you, but are you willing to be saved? Are you willing to come forward? To stand for? The only way you will be saved is if you seek the Lord as if it is the most important and urgent thing you will ever do. Because it is the most important and urgent thing you will ever do. That's the only way. Don't be half-hearted in your seeking for the Lord. That will never work. Stand for. Show yourself willing. Here I am, Lord. This is the most important thing I will ever do. It concerns the most important part of me, my soul. The salvation of my soul depends upon this. So here I am. Stand for. Show yourself. You must do that. Otherwise you will never truly find the Lord. And you must obey. Again, there was that second instruction given to the man with the withered hand. In verse 5, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out. He obeyed the Lord Jesus Christ. He obeyed. And it's amazing that he obeyed because this was impossible, ordinarily speaking. This man had a withered hand. He can't stretch it forth. How is he going to stretch it forth? His hand is withered. But dear friends, this is how it works when you obey God, when you simply obey God, then he gives you the power to obey. You know, so many people, again, they say to me, I would come to the Lord Jesus Christ, but, you know, for me it's impossible. I'm not spiritual enough. When, uh, when I read the scriptures, I don't understand them. I say to you, read them anyway. Obey the command to read the word of God and God himself will give you the understanding. People will say, you always say, pray, pastor, pray. Pray for salvation. I can't pray. I say, pray anyway. Obey the commandment and God will give you the power to pray and God will give you that sense that he is hearing your prayer. This man had a withered hand. He can't move it forward. It's impossible. But because he obeyed, then he was able to. So, dear friends, this is how it is. We make ourselves willing and we obey what God has commanded us to do. We pray to the Lord. We read the word of God. We repent. God has commanded us to repent. How can I repent? People say. How can I forsake all of my sins? I can't do it. It's impossible. Obey. Just come to the Lord and say, I will obey you. He will give you the power to forsake all of your sins and to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Obey the gospel call, dear friends. This is how we are saved. This is the wonderful miracle of the man with the withered hand and all the illustrations that come out of it. And well, just to close, the very end of verse 5, he stretched it out and his hand was restored, whole as the other. Remember, the rest of this man was, was perfectly fine. And now that his hand was restored, well, he was fully restored after meeting the Lord Jesus Christ. He was now as he should be, in full working order, so to speak. And this is how it is with Christ. You are never in full working order without the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be many things in your life. You can be a, a rich businessman. 
You can be a famous celebrity. You can be a successful sportsman. But you will never be what you ought to be. You will never be fully healed. Your soul will always be lost. The most important part of you will always be lost. You must go to the Lord. You must seek him. And you must draw near to him. This is how we ought to be walking with the Lord, having that relationship with God, loving God, serving him, cleansed of your sin. This is how you ought to be, dear friends, cleansed of your sin, not walking around with your sins still on you, cleansed of your sin and knowing that Christ has died for you. This is what the Lord wants you to have. And these are the messages that we have. Stand forth, dear friends. If you don't know the Lord, stand forth. Make yourself known and know the healing of Christ in your soul. Well, may the Lord bless these things to us.